And the Ruah of God signifies that when God created the man and the woman that were created in God's image, there's more to us than the physical. That the Spirit of God began to dwell in man. And man became a living being. So us becoming alive is connected directly with our spiritual life. So when Abba was saying that we were dead apart from Christ, we see that in Christ we're brought back to life again. So true living is found when we know that we are created for God, by God, and we are living in wisdom when we are best connected with him. And then we saw that God put the male and the female together in this, in this thing called marriage. Marriage is not the construct of society. Marriage is God's idea, as I've been teaching you in the past weeks. And once the man and the woman became one flesh, the Bible says they leave the father and mother, and then they become a union. This union is bound by covenants. And the family unit begins with the union of the male and the female. God then tells the woman and the man to multiply, to rule, to reign, to take care of what he entrusted to them. They were designed to reign. They were designed to rule. Both together in their partnership. Until they decided to disobey God and trusted in the wisdom of another. May I quickly say something here? The battle is one of wisdom. That is the fight that we fight. Will they trust the wisdom of their creator or the wisdom of the serpent? Which is really not a wisdom. It is foolishness masquerading as wisdom. And the battle that they faced in the beginning is the battle that we still face today. That's why I'm spending time in this series. God is saying, stay here, don't go anywhere. So I'm obeying the Spirit of God as I prepare every sermon. And he's saying, stay, teach my people, despise their wisdom, and receive my wisdom. We saw how through the second Adam, who Jesus is called the second Adam, we saw how a new creation has come. We become born again and our relationship with our Creator is being restored. Not only that, but our capacity to reign in life is restored through Christ. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So since Christ reigns over the entire creation, in him, through him, we also find finally the fulfillment of the original purpose in which God designed the man and the woman to be righteous rulers of this world. So reigning in life, therefore, is possible through Jesus who became for us the wisdom of God. This means that he, we can no longer think that we're defeated, but we can have dominion over sin. We can have dominion over guilt. We can have dominion over shame. We can have dominion over death. And we can live the holy life that God has created us to live. So reigning in life truly comes through Christ Jesus. We can reign in our marriage. We can reign in families. We can reign in our assignments that God has given us. That's what I want to teach you in this series. That in Christ, that reigning that Adam and Eve were called to rule over creation, to rule and reign, that was lost in the fall. But in Christ, the second Adam, we are able through him to reign again in life. So God is telling us and calling us, my children, come back to my design. When you accept the wisdom that your forefathers, Adam and Eve, when the wisdom they re re rejected, when you accept my wisdom and choose to live in my wisdom, you will reign in everything that you do. That doesn't mean you will not go through challenges. That doesn't mean we'll not have trials and storm, but that means that we'll stand. That means we'll continue to build the life that God has given us. 
Now, we've already laid the important foundation of the marriage by highlighting the pillars that hold the marriage together. And then we looked at how all of these pillars must stand on a firm foundation. You know, when a house is built, the first thing is the foundation. They come and lay concrete, and we just have one directly in front of us. The concrete is being built. It is after the concrete is set, the concrete dries, then the carpenters come and they build the pillars that stand on the concrete. So Christ is that rock, as we learned last week. Christ is the foundation on which we build our house. By wisdom, a house is built. Our families can only be built through wisdom. Today, I want us to begin looking at parenting. And I'm hoping the next few weeks is going to liberate you, free you, equip you, and show you that God's wisdom is the best way to live. By the end of today's message, I want to show you the important role of the father and the mother the important role they play in raising children and the next generation. So the husband and wife, they come together and usually, but not always, are given then children to steward. Now I want you to notice what I said there. God gives them children, not to own, but to steward. Now this message is relevant for every single person here. Those of you who have not been married, you will one day marry. And I want you to have the wisdom when you are married to know how to raise your children in God's way. Those of you who are married, I want you to know the assignment that God has given you and how God holds it serious. Parents are not owners of their children because God is the owner of all things. Parents are rather the stewards with responsibility to take care And look after what belongs to God. So I have the awareness and understanding that my children, I cannot claim them as my own. That's one of the one of the things that parents do that they begin to then miss it. They think I own them, I can do whatever I want to them. No, I don't own my children. (laughs) All I did is just just lay with my wife and, and the children came. I don't know how God constructed everything in the womb. God is the one that put everything together. They belong to him. And God has given them to us to manage them, to look after them. So the family consisting of the husband and the wife with children is the most optimal way a child can be raised. But we know throughout the scriptures and the reality of our world that that is not always the case. Families are complicated and often messy, dysfunctional. And we know this is because of sin. It's not because God's design is flawed or the family concept needs changing. No, God's design is perfect. That's not the issue. The issue is not with God. The issue is with us. When God designed everything to work in a certain way, he fashioned it, he put it in motion, and it's been working well with the rest of creation, except the rebels, which is us. And God said, let there be every plant and vegetation. And what happened? And they were. I was teaching my daughter. And they were. What God said, creation obeyed. And what did God do? He produced everything with seed in them to multiply after themselves. And until today, the trees are walking in perfect obedience. They're growing and they're flourishing. Every other part of God's creation is growing because they are put in motion by God's design. But it is the human that became the rebel. The human said, no, I want to decide my own fate. The human said, no, I want to be God. I want to be like God. And that's where the mess began. But I want you to know God's design is not flawed. God's design is perfect. The family is not flawed. The, the marriages are not flawed. I don't want you to look at marriages that are, that are, that are not resembling the, the wisdom of God and think that marriages are flawed, that there's something wrong with God's design. That's what the world is doing. Marriage is flawed. There's something wrong with the design of marriage. So what should we do? We should redefine it. <laughs> Parenting is, ro- is flawed. So what should we do? We should redefine it. God's design is not flawed, my friends. Sinful people who often do not humble themselves to God's design 
end up hurting one another. Remember David? He sinned with Bathsheba, committing adultery and murder because of this. 2 Samuel 12, 9, quickly. Why did you despise the word of the Lord? That's what prophet Nathan said to him. Why did you despise the word of the Lord? By doing what is evil in his eyes. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Look at what prophet Nathan said to him. The premise of this distraction of this beautiful, happily married couple. What happened to their downfall? Why did Bathsheba's house fall apart? Because of him despising God's word, God's wisdom. David despised the wisdom of God. David despised the instruction of God. And he ruined the family of a happily married house. A woman who loved her husband. She said, oh king, don't do such a wicked thing. But he did not despise her. He despised God. You see, our actions are just the end result. It begins with the despising of our creator. That's what David did. The good news, however, is that we can do family. We can do marriage. We can do parenting, friendship, raising of children, God's way. That we can choose to not walk in that path. That's the call of wisdom that we've been learning. Wisdom is calling out. Wisdom is saying, hey, Follow me. And at the other side, foolishness, folly is saying, hey, follow me. So who will we hear? Where would we build our life upon? The father and the mother together are God's chosen instrument in raising children. And I hope that we understand that the enemy's strategic tactic is redefining what God has already defined. And he's attacking God's design. Governments all over the world, especially in the West, have continued to attempt to redefine gender, sexuality, family, and marriage. The family is seen to be outdated, traditional, old, so it must be redefined. It must be modernized. So the modern family, therefore, can look like whatever you want it to look like. The modern family is not the husband and the wife and children living in a house. The modern family can be anything that you want it to be. And I want you to know this fight is spiritual. Our warfare is not against flesh and blood. Our warfare is spiritual. It's an attack on God's creation, a rejection of God's design. It's a demonic attack and warfare that we see in our generation. And we must not bow down to these redefinitions. We must not shy away because of the persecution that will come. And persecution from the outside is expected. But I want you to know, mark my words, persecution will come from the inside. That's the persecution that we need to prepare for. The outside is not surprising for governments to attack churches. You will see the persecution that would arise among the body of Christ. It's already infiltrating into the churches, into different denominations, rejecting God's wisdom, redefining marriage in churches. Priests, preachers becoming oracles of God, claiming to be oracles of God who have denied the wisdom of God. So we must not shy away of the persecution that comes. One article said this, the world, and I quote, the world will often say, Wait to teach your children until they grow up and can decide for themselves what to believe. Let me translate this idea for you. What they're actually saying is this. Wait until we have brainwashed your children with secularism and then, we, and then when you teach them the truth, they won't listen to you anymore. End of quote. See, that's what our government tells us. Don't don't tell your children what to believe about gender. Don't tell your children what to believe about faith. Let them grow up and then they can decide for themselves. All they're saying is this, do not do parenting, let us do the parenting. Let us fill their minds with everything that is demonic and then when they come of age, then they will know that your words are not the truth. It's a war. And I hope your eyes are open, my friends. It's a war. We're in a war. And we need to wake up and begin to fight 
the right fight. We need to begin to pray and ask God to give us his wisdom. The government, the school is not the one entrusted with children to be raised. Children must be protected and taught the truth by the father and the mother. A child needs both their father and their mother in ensuring the healthy development of the child. The first point that I want to make today is I want you to know that parenting begins in the womb. I came across an interesting research article on the National uh, Library of Medicine. The article was on the impact of maternal stress, depression, and anxiety on fetal neurobehavioral development. And this is what the article said, and I quote, <coughs> clinical studies link pregnant women's exposure to a range of traumatic as well as chronic and common life stresses, bereavement, daily hassles, and earthquake to significant alterations in children's neurodevelopment, including increased risk for mixed handedness, autism, affective disorders, and reduced cognitive ability. More, rec more recently, maternal antenatal anxiety and or depression have been shown to predict increased risk of neurodevelopmental disorders in children and to confer risk for the future mental illness. Reports show that elevated levels of antenatal depression and anxiety are associated with poor emotional adjustment in young children. The impact of women's anxiety and or depression during pregnancy has been found to extend into childhood and adolescence, as well as to affect the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, HPA, I don't know how to pronounce it right, axis, predicting attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, symptoms in eight and nine-year-old children, as well as alterations in HPA axis activation in four months olds and in our laboratory and in 10 and 14 to 15 year olds, end of quote. What these researchers are discovering, the condition of the mother's state as she's pregnant directly impacts the child that's in her womb. And they're discovering many disorders that the child, that the child can face if the woman and the mother is not protected and protecting her heart and her mind during pregnancy. This is so fascinating. Caring for the child doesn't begin after the child is born into the world. It begins in the mother's womb. Researchers are learning that the child in the womb is impacted not only by the food and the drink the mother consumes, but also by the mental health of the mother that deeply affects the child. Let's look at what happened to the wife of Phineas in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 19 to 20. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when, she had, and when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about that time of her death, the woman attending her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she died after hearing this bad news. Bad news. The sudden complication of bad news, compilation of bad news, the ark of God being captured, her husband passing away, her grandfather, her sorry, father-in-law passing away, it became too much for this woman. And as she was about to give birth, she died because of the traumatic things that she heard as she was about to give birth. So this tells us something. Husbands, we must understand that the part of our role in, in loving and protecting our wife is utterly important during the pregnancy of our wife. When our wife is pregnant, men, you need to understand this. When your wife becomes pregnant in the future, how you treat her during pregnancy is very, very important because it impacts the child that's in her womb. We have a responsibility and a duty of care. We must not put our wives 
in sorrow, grief during pregnancy as it impacts not only the wife whom we love and we've made a covenant with, but the child that's in the womb. And mothers, knowing that your mental health impacts your child gives you understanding to take great care in being intentional of what you allow to take precedence in your mind. I'm going to speak in this series about mental health in a very lengthy way, and I want us to understand what God has given us to regulate our mental health. What does God's word say? But I'll move forward for the sake of this sermon. Mothers, I want you to know something, and women in this room. You can pray over the destiny of your child while they're in their womb. You don't have to wait. Parenting doesn't begin once the child has come into the world. It begins in the womb. You can lay your hands in faith, by faith. You can begin to declare, God, I pray for this child in the womb. Whatever destiny you placed upon this child, I want to align myself with you, Lord. And I want to begin to pray over the blessing of this child and begin to pray for every developmental stage of the child in your womb. Remember what happened when Mary visited Elizabeth. The Bible says that the the child in, in Elizabeth's womb, it leaped with joy. And then she became filled with the Holy Spirit. We see many places in scripture where God says that he filled the child with his spirit in the womb. So we need to understand that parenting begins. I want to lay today a foundation for parenting. Parenting begins in the womb. So we cannot take for granted the times that we spend before even the child comes into the scene so the mother and father therefore must know their role in parenting that it begins in the womb secondly god knows the child better than you parents i want you to understand this god knows the child better the psalmist understood this in psalm 139 verse 13 to 16 i read it in the amplified it says this for you formed my innermost parts you knit me together in my mother's womb I will give thanks and praise to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed in secret and intricately and skillfully formed, as if embroidered with many colors in the depth of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were appointed for me, when as yet there was not one of them even taking shape. So God already knows and has already written down the destiny of every child while they're in the womb. And the psalmist understood this, that God, you know me better than anyone else, better than my family, better than my parent. God, you know me. You are the one that put me together in my mother's womb. That means there is a destiny. Every single one of us has a plan, have an assignment that God has given us. Parents must realize that God is the one that forms the child in the womb. God creates each child with an appointed days and an assignment. That's what the psalmist is saying. In the womb, you've already appointed my days. You've already put forth the plan that you have before they come to being. And the role of the parent is to shape the child into that God-given destiny and not their own plan. God said this to Jeremiah. I mentioned it before, Jeremiah 1 to 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. (laughs) This goes further. Not while you're in the womb, but before you were in the womb, Jeremiah, I want you to know this. I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. To do what? I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God tells Jeremiah, hey, Jeremiah, I knew you before your parents knew you. I knew you and I know you better than anyone else. And guess what, Jeremiah? I've already set you apart. I've already called you. I've already anointed you. Not after you came of age at the age of 15, 16. No, while you were in your mother's womb, I called you. There's an assignment attached to you. Can I encourage every single person in this room right now? You are not insignificant. You are not without a purpose. You have a purpose attached to you. When you came forth into this world, you are not a coincidence. You are not an accident. You are ordained for such a time as this, in this specific hour, with an assignment. And God has a plan for your life. 
Parents, please learn to trust that the Lord knows what he's doing better than you. And when I say parents, I want you to know I'm speaking to every single person here. And I want to show you in this series that even if you, if you don't have children when you grow up, that you will still can become a father. You can still become a mother and raise up a generation. Parents, ask the Lord to reveal to you the destiny of your child and do not push your own agendas on the child. You know, some parents, they want to vicariously live out their dreams through their children, completely ignoring the will of God. They push their children to become doctors. They push their children to become this and that. Not because they see that that's the gift that the child has, but because they never had that opportunity. So my child, I want you to live out what I could not live. But we have to understand that God gives every child the set of characteristics, skills, the mannerisms, the personality that lines up with the assignment that God has given them. You know, my wife and I, we always ask the Lord to give us wisdom, to point out our children, what he has created them for, the destiny that is upon them. And we always are reminding ourselves, our plans are not going to prosper in their life. But we always say, God, let your plans prosper in their life. We don't want to say, hey, you have to do this and you have to go in this certain way. No, we've understood, God, you know them better than we know them. So let your will be done in their lives. When I lay hands and pray for them, the nights that I pray for them, I say, God, may your plans, may your vision, may your dream in the night, let them see dreams, Lord, of the destiny that you have for them. Show them, give them guidance, reveal it to me. Show me the plans and the assignment that you have for them. That means we don't force them to do things that we would like them to do, but rather see the strength that they already are created with and develop them. Parents, we must trust the Lord's plan for the child. A great example of this in the scriptures is Hannah. Powerful, powerful story. If you're not familiar with the story of Hannah, Hannah is barren and she cannot have a child. And she is so grieved and she begins to cry and plead with the Lord. And she goes into the temple of the Lord to the point where Eli believes that she's drunk. Because <laughs> she's there and just her mouth is always moving. She's like, this woman must be drunk. And, he's, and she says to him, I'm not drunk. I'm just grieved because I do not have a child. And she made a covenant with God. She said, God, give me a boy, give me a son. And I promise you this, I give you a vow. If you give me a child, I will give him back to you that he may serve you all the days of his life. So Hannah, God hears her prayer and he gives her a boy. Listen to what Hannah did. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27 to 28. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I am giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worship the Lord there. What a powerful thing we see Hannah doing. Hannah, as hard as it was for her, she knew that her child being in God's will was better than her plans. The Bible says after she weaned him, after she finished breastfeeding him she took him to the temple and she said you will remain in the temple of the Lord serving the Lord all the days of your life you know Samuel went on to be one of the greatest prophets that walked this earth why because there was a parent there was a mother who understood the assignment of the child there was a father when he said to her what, what are you doing he, she told him and he said I do with the child as you see best. And he allowed her. He agreed with her. And he went on to become one of the greatest prophets. Listen to what scripture testifies about Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Everything that Samuel said took place. He wasn't this prophet that looked at Instagram and, and Facebook to predict things. No, God showed him. He told him what was to come. He would declare it and God would fulfill it because he was speaking what God has spoken to him. Why did this all happen, my friends? Because a, a mother understood he belongs to God. She said, God, your will is better for his life. She trusted the will of God for her child's life. When I was in Bible college, I remember 
one particular night, I had a dream. And as I had the dream, it was the most random dream that I saw. The dream was about one of the students in Bible college who was an international student. He came from, uh, what I think he was... Um, Hong Kong. I think he came from Hong Kong, but he was an international student and he was studying there and I really don't have a relationship with him. That's what made the dream so weird. I say hi when we walk by, but I don't really know him that well. And the dream that I saw is this. He's standing in front of a massive gold building. I'm talking about huge construction. And he's standing in front of it, folding his, his arm like this, and he's wearing a chef's hat. And I can see in the dream that that's a restaurant. It's a magnificent, beautiful restaurant. And he's folding his arm. It's like, I don't know if you've seen the show, Head Chef. He's like the head chef and he's like proud of the building that is behind him. And I'm like, what a random dream. Why am I seeing this? And we're in the library. I'll never forget it. We're in the library and he happened to be a few uh, tables beside me. And God says to me, tell him the dream. Can you imagine how awkward that is? I don't know this man. I don't really talk to him. And I approach him and say, hey, I saw a dream about you. I'm like, I'm battling. The whole time I'm doing my essay, I'm like, God, I can't. This is so awkward. Tell him the dream. So I go up to him. I'm like, hey, man, look, I know it's going to be a bit weird, but I had a dream last night and you were in the dream. And I told him the dream that I just expressed to you. And all of a sudden, I see tears coming into his eyes. And I said, does this mean anything to you? And he opened up and shared with me his story. He said, in my country, growing up, education is very important. And my mother and father always wanted me to become an engineer. So I did my engineering degree. I gave them the degree. I gave them the certificate. But that was never my passion. My passion, the dream that I had from childhood, my mom and dad would not accept it. And I said, what was that? He said, I've always dreamed to become a chef open my own restaurant and feed the poor people in my country. And he said, when you said that dream, it shook me to the core. And I said, hey, look, bro, (laughs) this is not a coincidence. Clearly God is speaking to you here. And I prayed with him and I said, look, seek God, begin to pray about this. You see, sometimes as parents, if we're not aware of the destiny, the plan, the assignment that God has over our children, We can force them to do something that they were never designed to do. Like this man. Wasted a degree. Gave it to the parent. And now wants to pursue what God has really given him a desire and a passion for. So I want you to know that God's plans are higher than our plans. And the last thing that I want to share with us as we lay this foundation on parenting is this. Parents play the most important role in the child's spiritual development. Matthew 19, verse 13 to 15 says this, Then people brought the little child to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. So the parents are bringing their children, their babies. Some, some translations say they're infants. They're bringing them to Jesus. Why? To lay his hands and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Some translations said they said, Don't bother the rabbi. Don't bother the teacher. Why? In the eyes of the disciples, children are insignificant. They're not worth the time of Jesus. What did Jesus do? Verse 14. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. As as busy as Jesus was, he told his disciples, do not hinder children from coming to me. The parents wanted to so desperately to, to lay, uh, for Jesus to lay his hands on them and to pray for them. Children were not insignificant for Jesus, but precious to him. And parents, we have to be the vehicles that bring children over to the Lord, to not hinder them from going to Jesus. You know, we sometimes think that children are too young to go to Jesus. They're too young for their for hands to be laid on them and prayed over. They're too young for the scriptures to be taught. I came across an article that said month 15 month to 20 something month was the age that a child learns best. I was shocked. 
15 month old. I used to say even to Ayush, uh, she used to tell me, go and read the Bible to them. I'm like, they're saying Google Gaga. I'm <laughs> What's me reading Bible? What's I going to do to them? She's like, no, go and speak to them. Go and put on worship and worship. I'm like, do they, they don't understand yet. But the formative years are very early. Researchers are saying by the age of 13, a child has fully developed their worldview. After that, they want to then begin to try out their own things. But before then is the time that we have to develop the spiritual life of children. Jesus clearly said, let the children come to me. And as parents, we, might, we must make it our goal to bring them to Jesus. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 to 9. This is the most important part that we need to understand as parents. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Moses is speaking to the Israelites. What were the command? Love the Lord. The verse before this, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength. He said, this is the command God is giving you. And what does he tell parents? Firstly, you must walk in it yourself. You must wholeheartedly love the Lord yourself. And then what? Repeat them again and again to your children. Other translations say diligently teach them to the children. Talk about them when you are at home, when you are on the road, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. Tie them around your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And the rabbis of Jesus' time, they misunderstood this quote completely. The Pharisees, they took it as a religious thing. They literally wear the, wear the scriptures and the commands of God in the, in the front let's hear, and they walk around and they pray, thinking it's a literal interpretation. But it was a deeper thing that Jesus was teaching, that God was teaching. He was saying, first live it yourself, first love, and then teach your children and make it your goal to model spiritual, spirituality everywhere you go. You know what's interesting about the Pharisees? They did everything on the outside right, but they didn't live it. <laughs> they didn't believe what they, were, what they were teaching others. And as parents, we must be careful of that. Moses tells the Israelites that they are to firstly commit themselves to God's commands wholeheartedly by loving God with all their hearts. And then they are to repeat them again and again, <laughs> diligently to their children. You know, the average student spends 10 to 12,000 hours in class, plus thousands of more hours doing homework. 10 to 12,000 hours of their life they spend in class. If children get that many hours getting an education, how much more shall we know the importance of teaching them God's word, God's truth. We neglect it. And I want you to know the home is the best place for spiritual development. Teaching children is extremely time consuming and requires repetition and diligence. So we must not get tired in repeating them again and again. You know, one of my kids' favorite terms is I forgot. <laughs> Mercy, uh, didn't I tell you this? Dad, I forgot. I know it's a cop out, but dad, I forgot. It's everything I forgot, dad. Dad, I forgot. I don't remember. I forgot. And I have to repeat it. It's tiring. It's annoying. It's frustrating. But especially when it comes to the spiritual realities, we must teach them again and again and again and again. Talk about them at home. Talk about them on the road, going to bed, getting up. Children's spiritual needs go far beyond attending church. Some parents think by dropping their children to church that they're doing their part regarding the spiritual needs of their child. <coughs> no, that's part of our, our family of believers. That's part of it, but that's not where spiritual development happens. One Two hours a week does not develop a child. Your child spends thousands of hours in their lifetime learning about math. <laughs> and they still, at the end, some of them don't get it. <laughs> How much more spiritual realities? You don't pass it on. You teach them. Amen? You teach them through example. The key is done in the home. Teaching them in everyday life, in real life situations, 
is what is really life transforming. That is where they make the connection between knowledge and practical application. This is where they learn how to live out their faith. That's why my wife and I, we make it our intentional uh, uh, plan to teach them in everything that we do, in every moment of life. God's presence in the family home should be so central that it's natural to speak about God. That you raising about Christ and, and, and spirituality shouldn't be an abnormal thing, my friends. It should be the natural thing to do. That's the kind of thing that I want you to know, that in our homes, that's the environment, the condition that God wants us to build in our homes. You know, I, you and I, we intentionally talk about God when we spend time with the kids, no matter what we're doing. On the road trip, we'll go to the road trip, we see the beauty in nature, the waterfall. Oh, dad, that's so beautiful. Yeah, it's so beautiful. And we use that as a point of contact, point of connection to tell them about God as creator. Driving them to school. This week, we just saw a rainbow after it rained. Dad, look at that double rainbow. It's beautiful, isn't it? What do you think a rainbow means? Point of contact. Just using every opportunity intentionally. We watched a movie called Inside Out 2 during the holidays. Oh, I love it, man. It was a really, really good movie. Because it's the truth. That's what happens in the mind. It's a really creative way of depicting that. And we used it as a point of contact to show them how God governs our emotions. and what We try to use every moment as a teaching moment, and we're intentional about it. Parents play the most important role in influencing their children. In a recent article on family research, the council website titled, Kids Will Be What They See, they comment on the latest research done, done by the Cultural Research Center, and the findings are not surprising. Researcher George Barna, he comments this, your children, and I quote, your children are watching, sorry, young children are watching their parents. They're listening to their parents, and they're trying to put these two things together. The problem is, they're seeing a contradiction between word and deed. The conclusion we discovered that children draw is this. What a shame. My parents seem as confused as I am. So this faith that they're talking about must not have the answers, end of quote. You see, as we're teaching our children, children are seeing everything. My children, they don't let anything pass. <laughs> I'm talking about anything that I do. They're constantly watching everything that I'm doing. They don't just see the preacher up here. They see the way I treat my wife. And when I hug her, they say, aww. And Zoe now, she doesn't like it. She's like, eek. I don't, know, I don't know where she got that from. And, and they just, you know, but we try to model it. We try to show them. And I say, God, help me. Give me wisdom to not be a hypocrite in the things that I'm doing. Parents, we must understand that children are watching whether our theology matches our actions. Many surveys that I can quote have been done that show parents are the greatest influences on their children's beliefs and worldview. Above educators, teachers at school, above spiritual leaders, pastors, youth leaders, above friends, many research has been done to show children trust their parents most in their life to impart spiritual knowledge and truth. So when we confuse them with hypocrisy, we are driving them away. It doesn't mean that we must be perfect, but it means that we must live out our faith and invite them into our imperfections and our development. We must model it for them, as I've said many times. Model forgiveness. Model accountability. We must model it in everything that we do. Then we can teach our children and invite them to learn from us. We cannot outsource this task to pastors. I have sat down with families that have said to me, it is your job to raise my child. And I looked at them in the eye and I said, how dare you? Do not put this accountability on me. That is your task. You cannot outsource this. Do you know our generation, the millennials especially, we outsource everything. I can't be bothered doing the grass. I'm going to get someone else to do it. I, I don't want to teach my child. I'm going to get a tutor to teach them. But spiritual life, you cannot outsource it. 
God has given that to the parents. So we have a responsibility to raise our children in the instruction of the word. We are the main responsible person for the spiritual development of our children. Listen to what Paul testified about Timothy. I'm finishing the sermon. 2 Timothy 1.5 says this. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, and in your mother Eunice, and now I am persuaded now lives in you also. Timothy didn't just be the man that he was by accident. It was an investment of his grandmother and his mother. He grew up in a household where faith was not only taught, but it was modeled. And his mother learned it from her mother, his grandmother. His mother intentionally taught him the scriptures. How do you know this? Listen to what Paul said in the same letter, chapter 3, verse 14 to 15. But you must remain faithful. Speaking to Timothy, to the things that you have been taught, you know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood. Some translations say from infancy. And they have been given, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. So who taught Timothy the scriptures? It wasn't Paul. Paul met him after he's a young adult. It wasn't Paul. Who equipped Timothy with the wisdom for salvation, to receive Christ as his personal savior? His mother and grandmother, as we saw earlier. They invested and they taught him the holy scriptures. He can trust his mom to teach him the truth. Paul met Timothy after All the hard work has been done by the mother. And he said, you young man, you're going to be useful for me in the ministry. And he took him along with him. But Paul gives credit to his mom and his grandmother. So as parents, we have a duty of care. And what is that? To invest in the spiritual life of our children. Timothy then walked in his destiny, accompanying Paul and building the church as a pastor. He is the one that took on the baton from Paul and continued building the church. You know, it's fitting that when my dad called me, he said, uh, you're, um, my son, I'm coming to your church today and I want to I wanna come and visit you today. My dad is here, by the way, if you're, not, uh, if you're not familiar with my dad. He's my hero. He's my hero. And, and I'm not just saying that. I respect that man. And everything that I have grown up, I owe it to my mother and to my father. You know, my dad he would always have Bible study every single day. It wasn't an option. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't have an option. You come, even the Amharic songs that I have, that I know, it came from the Bible studies that I have. Yes, I was rebellious. Yes, I was hiding many things from him, but he was consistent. And I'm going to teach you the important role of the father and the mother in the coming weeks. But he was, he was very, very stern in the way that he raised me. You know, when I used to trick my mom, mothers are very soft. They believe, you know, just leave him, you know, he's stressed. Just leave him. And I used to say to my mom, mom, I've got so much assignments. I'm stressed with school. I've got some, I was lying. I just wanted to stay home and, and just go out with my friends, watch porn and all of these things. And, but my dad, he, he was onto it. <laughs> uh, get into the car. You're coming to church. Whether I liked it or he took me to church. Whether I liked it or we, we had Bible study. He didn't just do that. He modeled it in the house. Am I saying my dad and my mom were perfect? No. Am I saying I wear No. (laughs) Our house had issues just like every other house have issues. But what did I see? I I saw it modeled in my house. I'll never forget the times my dad would kneel down and ask for forgiveness to me when he has done wrong in whatever it is. He modeled that for me. I learned how to be a father through him. That, does that mean that if our parents are not present in our life that we cannot receive those things? No, it doesn't mean that. God, in, in Christ, there's always hope. But I want to just, I didn't plan for him to come, but Dad, I want to honor you. And I want to say thank you for faithfully raising me up to be the person that I am today. So as I conclude today's message, church, I hope that we have seen the great role and the importance that parents play in a child's life. 
I know our world is telling us parents are not, uh, they don't know anything. They're old traditional. Don't listen to them. They're foolish. They're just old school. And your teacher has become TikTok and your worldview shaper has become your, your friends at school. But do not despise your parents. I'm going to teach you next week why the Bible teaches us. Your parents are integral. They're the ones that love you most. They're the ones that care for you. They watch over you. Parents, you play an important role in a child's life. And that begins in the womb. God entrusts parents to raise children for his purpose. So parents can rest assured that God knows what he's doing. We didn't need to be worried. We don't need to be worried about the future of our children. God has got them. I thank God that God has a plan for the future of my kids. I don't need to worry. I don't need to stress about the noise that is out there. I can say, God, their destiny is in your hands. And finally, let us remember that parents play the most important role in the spiritual development of their children far above any other person. So we must prioritize to intentionally teach our children about Jesus by first living what we preach. Parents, you are the most important and needed person for the healthy development of children. Let's all stand in prayer.